Barnabas chapter one, verse four, this is what we read. For he has made known to us through all the prophets that he does not need holocaust. And you, when you go to the Greek, this is holocatoma. It means burnt offering or oblations. It's just sacrifices. Saying at one time, what is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I am sated, meaning I've had enough with the holocaust, with, with the burnt offerings. And desire neither fat of lambs nor blood of bulls and goats, not even when you come to appear before me. For who has demanded these things from your hands? You shall no longer tread my cord. If you bring flour, it is in vain. Incense is an abomination to me. I cannot suffer your new moons and Sabbaths. Straight out of chapter one in Isaiah. And the purpose of why Barnabas has brought this to the table is to show you God cannot stand Christians observing the Sabbath. It's an offense to him. When you begin to dig into this subject more and you begin to dig into the history, you now have this great magnification. You now have a perspective where you can look at the Christian church today And you can understand why the teachers are teaching what they are teaching in regard to the Sabbath, why they believe what they believe in regard to the Sabbath. This he accordingly did away with, so that the new law of our Lord Jesus Christ might be without restraining yoke and without man-made offering. Pay close attention to what he just said. Does it at all sound familiar? Basically, Barnabas has just come out and said, because of the redemptive, because the awesome work of Jesus, the Sabbath is done away with. It's been abolished. The first time I read this, and this was many, many years ago, the first time I read that, I almost fell off my chair. I was astounded because within a, a short period of time, I had been engaged in discussions with other Christians about the Sabbath and the very thing that was coming to my ears. The very defense that I was hearing from the other side was, Jesus did away with the Sabbath. And what blew my mind is, is man, this is, this is not new. This discussion I'm having existed all the way back in the early second century. And we know, I mean, historically, we know this was disseminated. This had broad reach to the point it's included in Codex Sinaiticus. This epistle has incredible influence to the point we are hearing the same things today, stemming right from here. It's incredible. Furthermore, concerning the Sabbath, it is also written in the 10 words, the Aseret HaDevarim. He's referencing the 10 commandments, which he spoke to Moshe face to face on Mount Sinai and sanctify the Lord's Sabbath with clean hands and a clean heart. Now, if we're to compartmentalize this statement, I'm 100% on board. I totally agree. He's he's recounting the Ten Commandment event. And yes, Moses did speak to God face to face. And guess what? God did say, you are to sanctify the Sabbath. What does the commandment say? Remember the Shabbat to keep it holy. What does it mean to sanctify? It means to keep it holy. What does holy mean? It means to sanctify. You set it apart from the rest of the week. This is not a, a common day. This is uncommon. And then he says, with clean hands and a clean heart. He is really kind of conflating two passages, Exodus 28 and Psalm 24. Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. And the irony here is, is I'm 100% in agreement. In regard, literally, to the context of Shabbat, this is the Lord's heart. That when you come into Shabbat, you do so with clean hands and a clean heart. This is what you do. But unfortunately, he goes on to say this. Furthermore, he says, you shall sanctify it with clean hands and a clean heart. If therefore anyone is now able by being clean of heart to sanctify the day which God sanctified, we have been deceived in every respect. In other words, you can't keep it holy. God said, Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Barnabas comes on the scene, that's impossible, you can't do it. Is it not peculiar to you that God would give us commands like remember the Sabbath to keep it holy or how about honor your mother and father? 
Can, can I not do that? Can I not not take the Lord's name in vain? Can I not not steal? Can I not not commit adultery? I just don't have the ability. That's not going to go over well with my wife. I'm just going to tell you. It's, it's this kind of rhetoric that is very, very disturbing. So two things we learn from Barnabas in his assessment that was disseminated in early Christianity. Two things. Number one, God hates the Sabbath, the Christians observing the Sabbath. It's an offense to him. This is his perspective. And number two, you can't keep it even if you wanted to. As you get into the turn of the second century, as I mentioned before, there was an explosion. All of a sudden, you started to notice Gentile Christianity, the Gentile church started to separate itself from the Jew. And when I say the Jew, I am not talking about unbelieving Orthodox Jews. I am talking about Messianic Jews. Messianic Jews that would not compromise the Passover. They would not compromise their observance of Shabbat. You start to notice there's a hostility, there's a disdain for the Jew. And this should be disturbing considering the fact that what Christ did is he broke down the middle wall of separation, Ephesians 2. And as soon as the Lord did that, the devil went out to rebuild it, to separate the Jew from the Gentile. The very proof text that Barnabas, that letter we just looked at, used to show that God hates Christians observing the Sabbath was Isaiah chapter 1. What does Victorinus come to the table with? To do away with the Sabbath. So Christians abandon the Sabbath. He goes to the same text to Isaiah 1. And he just comes out. God hates it. Why would a Christian want to do something that God hates? Makes no sense. And then he says this. Which Sabbath he and his body abolished. There it is again. The same thing that Barnabas was teaching. It's because of Christ we abandon these things. Is the exact same thing that Victorinus, a century later, was teaching. I mean, we can hypothesize, perhaps, very, may well have been that Barnabas, that letter, and that message very much directly impacted Victorinus, who was influential on the church. They're saying the same thing. Isaiah 1.13, and this is from our Bibles. Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new months, the Sabbaths, and the calling of the assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity in the sacred meeting. Oh, isn't that interesting? This little statement puts the entire thing of Isaiah 1 into context, which conspicuously was completely left out of the commentary of Barnabas, of the commentary of Victorinus. They left it out. This is the whole context. What is God upset with? He's upset with sin. You're going to come to my temple. You're going to lift your hands. You're going to praise me. You're going to call me your God. While you have a double-minded heart, while you are living in sin, while you're living and you're clinging onto your sins, and you joined yourself to the world, and you're going to come before me on these sacred assemblies that I have called? They are mixing the holy with the profane. That's the entire context. That's the problem. If you seek to be justified by Christ, and yet you yourselves are found sinners, you're walking in lawlessness, you're rejecting his commandments, he then says, is God therefore a minister of sin? And his response is a rhetorical question. He goes, of course not. Certainly not. Because that's what happens. If you're going to go out and you're going to call in the name of Jesus, yet you're going to still continue to walk in sin, but you want to present yourself to him, you're actually blaspheming his holy name because you're declaring the Messiah that I follow supports the way I walk. He's okay with me walking in sin. He's okay with my idolatry. He's okay with my covetousness, with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of all. He is okay. We just made him the one we call the Antichrist, the lawless one. Hey there, this is Mike at Corner Fringe Ministries, and I'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch our video. We hope that it blessed you and it encouraged you. And if it did, please hit the thumbs up on the video and share it with your friends and family.
It's also, if you haven't already considered, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Now, if you'd like to watch the entire video, click on this link. And if you'd like to watch the entire series and learn more about what we, we do and believe here at Corner Fringe Ministries, click on this link. Once again, I'd like to thank you for watching the video, and we hope to see you again soon. Shalom.